you have a very successful agency, you do celebrity influencer marketing, run these amazing marketing campaigns, and you know your shit. It's what I do. It's what I'm really good at. And I always felt people would judge me for it. I've been successful for a very long time, but I feel so much more confident about it. There's no reason why I shouldn't say it. Is it me being boastful if I really share that I'm the shit? <laughs> Positioning yourself as the expert, that is what actually makes you stand out more. Say, for example, you were covered in Forbes magazine. Let's just dream for a little bit. You will be. Let's yeah, get let's you there. Actually, okay, great. <laughs> what do you think ultimately determines the brands that really take off and those that don't? I'm going to tell you my formula. So oh, I, I feel like we're getting like proprietary <laughs> secrets here. I'm like, go on. <laughs> We are talking all things visibility today, which I don't know about you, it has been a challenge for me to step into being more comfortable being visible. You would think having a podcast, being on stage, that just comes easily, but my friends, it absolutely does not. So I have the expert in all things visibility and really getting your brand out there in such a bigger way. Amy, welcome to Powerhouse Women. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. We didn't know a few days ago that you were going to be here. And that's actually such a cool story and tie in to the conversation that we're going to have today about making yourselves visible, but also really claiming your place in the spotlight. So we're fresh off of the expanders retreat. We are expanded. We are very much expanded. <laughs> we're very much expanded. <laughs> and you had a really powerful breakthrough from Retreat One, which you were with us at Retreat One back in March. We are now recording this in October. We just finished Retreat Two. And I mean, you showed up in the room as a very different expanded version of yourself. But what it was is we saw you really own. We were just joking about this before we turned on the camera. You know your shit. Like you really do. You have a very successful agency. You do celebrity product placement. I'm probably like not saying the correct words, right? Celebrity inf influencer marketing, run these amazing marketing campaigns. And you had a real breakthrough in how you introduced yourself. Will you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Um, it's funny because I have been doing PR for years and yeah. I've been very good at getting my clients visibility, but I've never really stepped into my own yeah. and I've always, you know, hid behind my clients, if you will. Right. Yeah. And one of the things it being an entrepreneur, it's so important that you are visible yourself and in March, it was kind of funny because when we got up and did our intros, I got up and I was like, I do PR <laughs> and people are really kind of like, well, what is PR? And I feel like just stepping into that and owning what you do. I feel after the first retreat and I've had so many people tell me Rebecca Cafiero has been another mentor of mine and she has also, you know, why aren't you telling people what you do? You yeah. know, you do this amazing thing. You work with celebrities, you place products on television and movies. Why aren't you talking about this? And when I showed up, I had my good friend Marissa, you know, tell me, you need to say what you do differently. And when I really owned what it is that I do and expanded, you know, over the course of the six months that we were, you know, from retreat to retreat, I feel so much more confident about it. Yeah. And it's funny because I've been successful for a very long time, but I feel more successful just saying it the way that I say it now. Yeah. Can you tell us how you say it now? Because it is pretty badass. <laughs> Um, yes. So I'm a PR expert. I specialize in putting brands in to the hands and in front of celebrities featured on TV and in movies, as well as featured in top tier media. Yeah. And you've always done that. I've always done it. And it's so relatable. And I think it's actually so beautiful that your personal breakthrough as an entrepreneur has been around allowing yourself to really own your 
expertise, be willing to be more visible because that's what you help others do. And isn't that so true that oftentimes the breakthrough that we need to have in order to step into our next level of success is the same breakthrough that the people we work with, the people we impact are going to have or need to have. So what was the change for you? Because we're speaking to an audience of other women who know their shit, who are experts at something that they do and may not feel as confident as you do now explaining what it is that they do. So for me, <laughs> working with celebrities, it's not who I am. It's it's what I do. It's what I'm really good at. Right. Yeah. And I always felt people would judge me for it. I always felt like seeing it would be, you know, kind of braggy, if you will. And I feel like the way that I am saying it now, I just feel more confident with it. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying the same thing. Yeah. I'm just saying it a little bit with more confidence. And yeah. absolutely, you know, being at the Expanders Retreat in March and growing with this wonderful, amazing group of women that you have curated this group of women have helped me come out of my shell and be more visible because I am the expert. Yes, I am the shit, as you said, right? <laughs> she really is. <laughs> and I'm really good at what I do. Yeah. And there's no reason why I shouldn't say it. Yeah. And I wanted to start there because one of the things I'd love to have you speak to, you know so many of the women in the powerhouse women community I really want to give people tangible next steps if they are struggling with feeling like they have some imposter syndrome around presenting themselves as an expert or having trouble formulating the words. And really, it's it, it's all PR, right? It's doing PR for ourselves as the founders, the creators of these businesses. So what has really helped you to break through and or maybe... I would love if you'd start with what were some of the things that you've had to overcome to step into this more confident version of yourself? And then what advice would you give to an entrepreneur, to one of your clients who's having trouble really owning that? Yeah, I love this question. So for me, stepping into my own, I feel like doing what I do, uh, getting, you know, clients, you know, featured in Forbes or, you know, into the hands of like very A-list celebrities. I didn't feel comfortable taking the credit for that. I gave my clients the credit for that because that is what I do, right? So I they're paying me to do this for them. So with me stepping into my own expertise and being more confident with it, I feel has brought me a different level of success um, just personally and being able to talk about what I do with confidence and just be that face of, you know, PR because people buy, you know, they sign up because of me. Which is and, all true. So true for so many of our businesses, right? They're right. Buying into our belief in ourselves. Absolutely. And I, you know, talk about how I can do everything with them you, for them more confidently. But then when I talk about myself, I'm like more humble and, yeah. you know, a little bit, you know, shy about it. So what I had to break through was being humble about it yeah. and not mm. talking about it. You, you, because everyone, yeah. it's funny because some people would be like, if I did that, I'd be telling everyone. Yeah. And with me, I'm just like, well, you know, um, so just being able to more confidently say it and owning what I do, because I am the expert. And I think that that was my breakthrough is realizing that I do this really well for people. And there is absolutely no reason why I shouldn't tell people and I shouldn't step into it more confidently. So my advice to the community is, it's interesting when I work with people that are the expert in their field, really kind of stepping outside of what it is you do, right? You had mentioned the other day that you're very comfortable on stage mm -hmm. and you feel like that is, you know, where that's where you feel at home. And everyone started their business in what they do because they feel like that is their home, right? That's where they feel most confident and comfortable. And being able to say that in positioning yourself as the expert 
that is what gets the visibility. Mm -hmm. That is what actually makes you stand out more. Yeah. You're so right. And it starts with us being willing to see ourselves. When you just reflected that back to me, it brought me back to this thing that I've kind of battled this entire time, which is, I think the thing that I'm really good at, or the thing that if we were to say, like, I'm the shit, is the thing that I, it just almost comes so easily to me. Some of the the nuances of even when every, every interview I've had today, the person has said, wow, you're so good at that. And then I want to downplay it. I want to be like, oh, well, who's not good at talking? When really it, it, it's a skill set to be able to facilitate an interview that people want to listen to. So what are some of the biggest things that you see get in entrepreneurs' way in terms of mindset blocks, belief blocks, of getting the visibility they really deserve? I feel that we get in our own ways mm-hmm. and we, we, we have that imposter syndrome. We yeah. have, you know, we downplay what we do and what our expertise is. So we often get into our own way and rather than confidently, you know, speaking about it and because we feel braggy, you know, I mean, that was part of my problem is I felt like I was bragging. Yeah. I mean, there's a group of, you know, friends that don't know what I do. I mean, isn't that wild, right? Like our personal closest friends have no clue what I do. They have no clue who I work with. And, and that's okay because sometimes I feel like they wouldn't understand it, but as entrepreneurs, it is so important for everyone to know what you do with the right audience, right? Exactly. Yeah. In, In order to find our way to the people who really need us, who need what it is that we have to offer. So in your work with brands, with, you know, brands like whether it's Glossy, I know you're working with our mutual friend, Lori Harder, to get her product out there in a bigger way. You've worked with some incredible brands. Where does your strategy start when you're thinking about PR? And really, PR is visibility. Mm-hmm. What's the first point that you start the process of strategizing how to get a brand or a person out there in a bigger way? Like what's something we could take away those who are listening if they are in the trenches looking to gain more visibility for themselves. Is there a formula you have? Is there a process you work through? How does that work and how can it relate to us as individuals? So I'm going to tell you my formula. So oh, I feel like we're getting like proprietary <laughs> secrets here. I'm like, go on. Um, so the formula is, I call it the PR formula. Okay. So it's building brand awareness gaining visibility to earn credibility. Mm. And if you put that formula together, you naturally will achieve the profitability. So that's my formula. But with there's so many different ways for a brand to be visible. So you mentioned Glossy, if you have a product based brand. So with Glossy, or with any other brand, like I work with baby products, a lot of baby and maternity products. So you take a product like Glossy, and what I'm doing with Lori is I'm putting that product into the hands of A-list celebrities, as well as back office studios, like makeup um, studios for television and movies. When people are sitting at the makeup chair, they have, you know, this buffet bar and having products sit back there. So these A-list celebrities are naturally using it. Oh, what's this? Glossy. And they have the opportunity to be introduced to it and drink it. So those are great opportunities to get your brand like really visible. With baby products, It's great. As a mom, I'm a mom of two. And boy, have the baby products changed over the course (laughs) of my lifetime. Yeah, they sure have. Oh, my goodness. And I work with a lot of products that change the way parenting is done. And so it really is exciting that I can help these, you know, women that are pregnant having babies Pregnancy is not comfortable. I mean, it it can be the hardest thing. And I I work with a client that has um, pregnancy pillows to make you to help you sleep better. So mm-hmm. being able to gift 
celebrities these products, you know, is really lights me up because I feel like that gives you the opportunity to get that product, you know, seen and known by, you know, certain people. So that's one element of the PR strategy. Mm -hmm. And it really is more of an organic element. Uh, because I do see that they often will, you know, place reorders and stuff like that for different products that we've put into their hands. But, you know, then there's the element of the actual media, you know, Forbes and Insider and yeah. all of that. Yeah. So what I'm almost hearing, too, is like the smaller scale version of this for someone who doesn't have the contact list that you have, and maybe they don't have the budget to hire an agency like yours who's operating at that level would be, you know, if you think about what is a celebrity, it's just the person that people are paying attention to what they're doing. So that's more, and I know you also work in influencer marketing. How could someone maybe think about this on the smaller scale when they're just starting out? Because I think we forget that we do have access to people. We can slide into someone's DMs and just say, hey, you know, I love what you're about. I would love to send you a product. Do you have any advice for how to do that in an effective way if someone's kind of working on more of a DIY budget and they don't have access to those celebrity green rooms? Yes, absolutely. There is a website called IMDB. Yes. Yes. And that has that's a website that you can look up and it's also an app. So you can look up, you know, different celebrities or, you know, if they're high level influencers and, you know, see how to contact them. So usually you want to reach out to their PR person. Uh, but you can also Google it. I mean, Google is such an amazing tool and Instagram as well. A lot yeah. of celebrities or influencers, like you said, because influencers are key too. they really have changed the way. Well, it's funny. I have been doing influencer marketing before the phrase was even coined. Yes. Um, I know you really are an OG. <laughs> I am an OG and I feel like I should be getting royalties from it. <laughs> But uh, influencer marketing, I mean, has really changed the way that people market their products Mm -hmm. and by sliding into their DMs and, you know, sending a message to them. Often influencers will actually have their email address on their um, Instagram handle. Mm -hmm. Especially if that's something that is a part of their Mm -hmm. brand strategy and they're open to different collaborations. Yeah, that's so true. Absolutely. So, and Google is a great resource when you're looking for people's emails or, you know, how to to contact them. Google is, yeah, that's like gold. I mean, quite literally, the secret to being an entrepreneur is just to know how to Google (laughs) things and be willing to just Google so many different versions of the same question. Isn't that so true? It's so true. Yeah. So true. And the quotes and all, of, yeah, whatever your Google search is, yes, that's what you need to do. So you mentioned you were doing influencer marketing before that was even a thing, before the world knew what that was. What led you to the world of PR? What had you want to start this as a business? I don't think I've actually heard your backstory behind that. So I've done sales and marketing for years, and I was actually in medical sales before I had kids. I have a 17 and an 11-year-old, and I thought when I was pregnant with my 17-year-old, I'm going to work, and I'm not going to quit my job. I'm not going to be a stay-at-home mom. Um, I, you know, I'm just this career woman. Well, that all changes as soon as you have kids. You're like, no, I, I, I want to be with my baby. So I quit my medical sales job because I was gone from six to six. Mm. And my baby, that's what time my baby woke up was 6 a.m. and went to bed at 6 p.m. So I literally never saw my baby. And I started selling advertising for a magazine, a local magazine in Phoenix. And somebody approached me to become a business partner with them. And so that kind of introduced me into the PR world, you know, and which was very natural. I mean, it's marketing. And that was when Nathan, my oldest, was about two years old. And I was in that business partnership for a bit. And then when Noah was born, I started my own. So that's when I started Chatterbox. And how has 
the growth of the company paralleled your journey as a mom? I don't know why I feel inspired to ask this, but I know that both are so important to you. And how have those two journeys, raising a business baby and raising two beautiful boys, now young men, (laughs) what did that journey look like? You know, at first it was, um, it was a lot, you know, I mean, I still had that work-life balance and when I went out on my own, I, I became very well known. I it had dissolved my partnership. So I became very well known very quickly. So, you know, starting my own was just a natural fit for me. And I, you know, immediately had, you know, a lot of people that followed me. So I was then married. So I had the support of, you know, my husband at the time. So I had his support. So doing that work-life balance was, you know, really easy for me. Uh, But now as a single mom and my kids are older, I inspire them as an entrepreneur. So I don't know. Do they tell you that? Yeah. Like, do they do they say it? Especially I'm just imagining teen boys. I'm like, tell me, uh, just make me cry. Just so my thinking 17 about that. year old, he's like, I think I want to do marketing. And I'm wow. just, and I'm like, oh, <laughs> yes, you're following in my footsteps. That's so sweet. So sweet. And then my 11 year old, I don't know if you know this or not. Um, my 11 year old, he designed some merch. He we designed a website. He designed a website. Wow. When he was 9 years old. So he yeah. like developed this little business that he wanted to do. He started making these. He called it Gigamon. And he made these Gigamon cards that were kind of like the Pokemon cards. Um and but like we're go- we'll go with it. Okay. Right? Yeah. We designed t-shirts and mugs. Um so I feel my dedication to my business has really, truly inspired my children to see that because I do have a really good work life balance. Yeah. And I feel like they see that and it, I, it inspires them. Yeah. That's such a cool experience to get to have as a mom. So take me back to those early days of really growing an agency. And how did you know that? you really had a skill set that you weren't seeing a lot of other people do. What was the genesis of like the initial start of the influencer marketing? What was that spark in you that you thought, hey, no one is tapping into this. And I think there's something here. So it's funny you asked me this question because it was really just natural for me. Yeah. I working in the baby product, you know, world and seeing these moms that, you know, are pregnant because they are just like us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I felt that they needed these products, you know, it would make their lives easier, uh, you know, as new moms. And so that was how I naturally just started reaching out to them and sending them products And then I just became, you know, the go-to person for it. Yeah. Was this in the days of, was Instagram the big platform at this time? Facebook. Where people mostly, I was going to say, because Instagram to me even didn't become as big a part of my life until more recently when I was building my first business. It was, it was Facebook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So way back then. Yeah. Wow. So what makes the most effective influencer marketing campaign? What are some of the elements that you see when you see it done really well? And when you see it done, obviously not by your firm, but not done so well. (laughs) Really, I think um, the strategy today is those nano influencers is Mm -hmm. having, you know, smaller people, especially if you're looking, if you're a newer brand yeah, and you're looking to really, you know, launch into that. I mean, because if you think about it, everything is at everybody's fingertips right now. So, you know, just getting these visuals. So for a newer startup, you could definitely gift some of these nano influencers in exchange for a post. I would recommend, you know, making sure that you get that, you know, some sort of agreement, you know, in in writing, right. Clear expectations. Yes, absolute Mm -hmm. clear expectations, but also, you know, reaching out. I mean, you're an influencer, 
I, I mean, and I, I'm not influencer marketing, but you are an influential person mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that people are interested in. People look to see what you're doing and stuff. So take a look at your audience and who your target audience is and look for those people that, you know, if you were to gift them organically, if you do gift people, you know, organically, mm-hmm without expectations, you definitely have to go into it thinking, I have no expectations, right? Right. And that's the celebrity angle. I absolutely have no expectations. Yeah. But when it does happen, you know, in either influencer or the celebrity angle, I think that um, that's how you become more sought after Mm -hmm. because you have good products, you're putting good products in, you know, to their hands. And if you have that that amazing product that you think everybody should, you know, have, that's where the yeah. campaign goes well. And I love how you talked about managing expectations, right? Because it is more of a, I, I almost want to say, and you can challenge me if this is the wrong way to think about it, it's a numbers game. So if you're sending product out to, you know, you're doing your research, you're hand selecting people you think would be a good fit, but then releasing expectation it's only really a matter of time before even just if one really loves the product, buys into it, organically starts to share it. And I think that's the part where I even the smaller businesses that I get to mentor when they'll be entertaining the idea of using affiliate marketing or influencer marketing like we're talking about is being really upset if, you know, because that's product, that's money, especially if it's a product-based brand, which it usually is, that's money going out the door, but then being really disappointed if they're not getting in return what they had hoped. And I think usually what I see is missing is the clear expectations, getting something in writing saying, you know, I would love to send you this product in exchange. What I would love to see is a post on your feed, one Instagram story, whatever it is, and getting that agreement ahead of time instead of just sending it out, hoping someone posts it and just not necessarily having the buy-in on the other side, which isn't maybe the best use of someone's marketing budget, especially if they're just starting out. Absolutely. And I mean, you have to take into account, obviously, the cost of your product. Yeah. Because uh, there are some products that, you know, that's not cost effective to just right. like, right. you know, just send out a hundred samples. Yeah. Um, clear expectations are, you know, super important because if you're gifting somebody, then you have to really think of that truly as a gift with absolutely no expectations. And you can say something two different ways and it will be received two very different ways. So it's all in how you ask for it. Mm, Okay. So can you give us some different, give us like the do not do this version. And then here is an effective way I've found to craft that messaging. So do not (laughs) um, say, hey, I'm going to send you this. And um, if you could please post about it and you have 30 days to post, you know, giving them this demand. You don't want to demand what it is where my approach and where I've been successful is it's much more gentle. It's much more soft. It's, you know, Hey, I just noticed you're having, you know, you're pregnant, you're having a baby. And I would love to send you some, you know, some of these products. I actually let them choose the products because then they have more of a buy-in to it Mm -hmm, as well. mm -hmm. And they feel, you know, kind of like they're shopping. Right. Uh, and you know, If you feel called to, you know, um, share your experience with it or, you know, if you love the product and, you know, want to say something about it, you know, feel free or Mm -hmm. something very Mm -hmm. gentle like that, not, you know, as demanding, Mm -hmm. be gentle. Mm -hmm. Or if you do have a, a request up front, being clear about that versus just hoping that it's understood. Yes, absolutely. And that would just simply be, you know, we'd love to send you this. Would you be open to posting? Yeah. You know, so you have the gifting, which is the way that I said it first. And then, you know, would you be open to posting if so? Yeah. I say no to most of those requests (laughs) into my inbox, but the one that got me, which is actually really ironic because my first job out of college was selling carpet, was free carpet cleaning. 
Listen, huh. we were about to rent out this house. It was like the right message at the right time. And I was like, I would be delighted to post some Instagram stories in exchange for free carpet cleaning. You're like, please. You just really never know. You never know. Okay. So the PR formula I want to really hone in on the visibility piece. So we've talked about like some of these different strategies that you use to help brands get visibility. What do you think ultimately determines the brands that really take off and those that don't from all of your years of experience? What are those elements that have someone really become this household name and really have this the traction the success that people are hoping for when they hire a PR firm and those that just really don't have those same result yeah so it really is about leveraging your coverage so tell me more yes what that means is so say for example you were covered in Forbes magazine just just let's just dream for a little bit yeah you will be i was like let's yeah, get let's you there actually, okay great <laughs> offline we'll talk about that um so say you were covered in forbes mm -hmm. magazine don't let forbes keep that information you know it is so important for you to leverage that coverage mm -hmm. i mean that coverage should be posted on your social channels Post it on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is one of the most underutilized mm. social media platforms out there. And it really kind of has a trifecta of people. So it has your journalists and editors in there. It has your consumers. And it also has your, if you are a product-based business, it has your retail buyers. Mm. So you have this, tri and investors for that matter, right? So, you know, you have this, is quadfecta a word? We just made it We one. just made mm -hmm. it Because we're the shit. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> so you have this pool of people that all have this disposable income and are very high level people. If yeah. you're on LinkedIn, you're very high level. So that is an underutilized platform, but it should be on your website. It should be, you should be shouting it from the rooftops because that is some really good information. Because if you think about it, think about the credibility, because that is where the credibility lies, mm -hmm. is having a third party talk about you is what gives you credibility. You posting an ad or talking about yourself I mean, it's great and you should be doing that, but it's you talking about yourself. But having that third party validation is one of the most important things to earn that credibility. Mm -hmm. That's so good. I heard it said once from someone else in this way that you're reminding me of. They said, you know, when you get those PR features, no matter how big or small, to PR your own PR. Yep. Meaning, Make sure people know about it. Give it more leverage. And as the publications that are putting out this content, that makes them more interested in giving you more coverage because you're bringing visibility back to them at the same time. And I never thought about it that way, but that's exactly the same thing that you're saying. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And one of the tricks in this, like if you're posting it on social media, is to tag the publication, tag the journalist, and tag anyone else that's involved uh, because so that brings those people into the conversation. So, so simple. And their audience. Yes. Oh my goodness. I feel like I could just pick your brain all day about all these little nuances to essentially what we've been talking about, gaining more visibility. But I would love to kind of start to wrap this up by even just bringing it back to this idea that so many of the women that we find ourselves in spaces with maybe have that same fear that I relate to that you shared of, gosh, is it is it me being boastful if I really share that I'm the shit? <laughs> <laughs> what would be your message to someone who is really struggling with that and not putting their gifts and their message out there for the world to see in a bigger way? My advice to that person to you listening that feels that imposter syndrome is bet on you. You know, you started your business for a reason and you are the expert of what it is that you do 
for a reason. And by standing proud and saying it with confidence, as scary as that seems, as scary as that sounds, that is what will resonate with people. And Mm -hmm. that's what will have people hire you. And if people don't know that you're the shit, <laughs> they're going to what it, what is it that Jen Gottlieb always says? It's like they're going to go hire someone else who doesn't care as much as you or maybe doesn't have the same skill set as you. And that always stuck with me. I you love know? that. Yeah. I, yeah. I totally butchered it. She says it in such a more eloquent <laughs> way. But it's just that reminder that if we don't have the courage and it takes courage to put ourselves out there, to be visible, to overcome whatever blocks we have to overcome in order to put ourselves in the position to serve someone, then that person who needs us and who is meant to work with us is going to go hire someone else. They're going to go work with someone else who may not care as much as you or have the same skill set that you have. And When I bring it to that, back to the impact piece for me, that's ultimately what does drive me. It's what gets me out of my own way to show up in front of cameras and these lights and, you know, this podcast studio. But I think it's also important for people to know that people like you and me, we do still have some of that fear to overcome as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like you know, we do get into our own heads and yeah. I've self-care, you know, different modalities of self-care has helped me overcome that mm. breath work and just, you know, some of the people in our world. So that's yeah. huge too. And your business besties, you know, if it weren't for my business besties, then, you know, the group that, you know, the whole community that, um, we've cultivated. Yeah. Look to them to help you with this mm-hmm. because they will. They're your biggest cheerleaders. Yeah. Oh, that's so well said. It's like the power of other women hyping each other up. Borrow that belief from your girlfriends it, until you have it in yourself. That's probably where the most the majority of mine comes from, too. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so for people who want to learn more about how to work with your agency specifically, work with Chatterbox, what's the best way to connect with you as the face of the brand, to connect with the brand in order to find out just the different ways that they can get their brand out there in a bigger way through all of the beautiful work that you're doing? Yeah. Um, LinkedIn is a great place. Amy Bartko at LinkedIn, um, as well as I am on Instagram, Amy Bartko at, in, um, yeah, just Amy Bartko. I'm like, we'll, we'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, I, we'll half put, the time I forget we, what my, Instagram, yeah. I forget my own phone number. So <laughs> yeah. So we'll make sure to, to link it all in the show notes, your website, your Instagram handle. Yes. You're so approachable. You really have such a big heart for the brands that you work with. How would someone know if their brand is the perfect fit for what your agency does? What is it that you you shared with us what you do and what are the the brands that you most love to work with in the space of the influencer marketing, getting them positioned on TV and in movies and with celebrities, what are the ones that when that inquiry comes through your inbox, you're like, oh yeah. Yeah. I want that. Um, (laughs) I feel like definitely, you know, fashion brands. So I'm talking to uh, this resort luxury resort brand, um, which is so fun and incredible. Um, so, you know, those type of brands that are, that really are ready to level up and, Mm -hmm. you know, really ready to be seen and have that, uh, you know, have that desire to be seen. Yeah. I feel like those are the brands as well as some fun service-based brands like our friend Allie, you know, um, I love what, you know, the beauty industry as well. Yeah. Amazing. So the last question is really more of a personal one and it's an opportunity for you and for all of us who are vicariously living this question through you to just acknowledge yourself for something. And you have, I've gotten a little bit of a front row seat to the growth you've had over the last six months at least, but just acknowledge yourself for something that maybe you haven't acknowledged yet. We just call it a powerhouse moment. But when I ask you, what's a recent powerhouse moment that you want to celebrate publicly, give yourself some visibility and be like, yes, I'm the shit. What, that's just what we're going to call this episode, by the way, I'm the shit, is (laughs) what's the first thing that comes to mind that you want to celebrate with us? 
I want to celebrate the fact that I bet on myself and I have invested in myself and chosen to put myself in rooms that may have made me feel a little bit more uncomfortable, you know, um, 12 months ago, Amy. Uh, but you know, today I feel like I belong in those rooms and I'm so honored to be in there. So mm. yeah, that's what I'm celebrating. I'm really proud of you for that. Cause Thank that you. is, it's a big deal. And I've gotten to see the transformation right in front of my eyes. And it reminds me of the power of stepping into those rooms that kind of make me want to puke, but also to realize that that's probably because there's some massive growth for me inside. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Bet on yourself. If you can do anything, you know, any listener, bet on yourself because you've got this. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me.